And first we're going to have uh, uh, Ben Woolley uh, visit with us. Uh, Ben's family has been involved, and for those that aren't familiar, and I know Ben's going to talk a little bit about the Sentara group and some family history, uh, but some things to know about Ben. His father, um, uh, Ken, back in the, in the 1960s, along with five other gentlemen, founded and started the, the Pig Improvement Company uh, there in England. And uh, Ben's father was, was certainly legendary in terms of his forward thinking on the genetic side, in terms of improving the genetics. Uh, ben has carried that tradition on in terms of his forward thinking, in not only in the swine business, but many of the operations that Sentara gets involved with, from the meat side to the Sentara markets, uh, the grocery store chains there in, in uh, Canada. And he really has is, is, uh, been progressive in thinking where is the best place for them to expand and raise pigs and be efficient and not only help their business but others. Uh, they've expanded a number of operations into, the, into South Dakota and in Iowa in particular. Um, and right now, they'll, by the end of this year, they'll manage upwards of 1.6 million pigs. They themselves have about 11,000 sows in Alberta and Ontario. Um, and Ben's been, uh, been associated with Ben. I first met Ben back in 2003 at the Banff Conference, and so we've been associated for a number of years. And really, he's going to bring a perspective of what they're trying to do, and really the next two speakers are kind of piggybacks on each other of, of raising pigs um, with minimal or no antibiotics and, 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 and management and what that means and how those businesses have evolved. So with that, I'll turn things over to Ben for his presentation, and he'll give a little bit more background on their business and then get into raising pigs without the use of antibiotics. Thank you, Ben. Good morning. Good morning. All right, everybody's awake. That's good. Uh, there's two things about me. The first thing is um, uh, I speak with kind of a funny accent because I'm originally from England. I lived in the U.S. for 20 years, and I lived in Canada for 20 years, so I'm kind of like the short, fat version of James Bond because I have three passports, right? So <laughs> just think of me that way and that'd be good. Uh, the second thing is we, we're very privileged to have worked with Kansas State for, for many years now, and, uh, and Joel and, and Steve have been, have been a great, uh, great asset to our organization. Um, Doug, and I, Doug, and, Doug McDougall, our veterinarian, is, uh, he, he's an independent vet, and, and we reckon that between uh, Joel and Steve and Doug, we have, have one of the best uh, consultancy teams in, 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 in pig production, and we're really proud of that. So Doug and myself are going to kind of tag team on the Sunterra, on the Sunterra story and, and, and our approach to antibiotic free production. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some things and, and, and give some opinions about the industry that some may not like. So if you don't like it, well, that's just my opinion, and you can, we can agree to disagree. And if you, you know, if you, but, uh, and, if you, and if you think it's interesting, we can talk about it. If you want to ask questions, I'm not, I'm not a great speaker. I'm, I'm a farmer. So if, if at any time you've got, you've, got a, you've got a question, just throw your hand up, and we'll, we'll have a discussion about it. So the more interaction we have, the better. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Sunterra. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sunterra to begin with. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our antibiotic-free program. Doug's going to drill down a little bit further and, and get into the weeds a little bit more and talk about, the, uh, and talk about the, the production itself. So a little bit about the company. Our company was founded in 1970 as PIC. Dave Price came over, to, uh, uh, came over to the UK and lived with my family for a year to learn the PIC business, and they moved and then moved back to Canada, and, uh, and then uh, my dad and, and Howard Fredine and, and Jack Greenway, some names that you may be familiar with, uh, started PIC Canada in, in 1970. Uh, Dave went on and, and uh, developed the PIC brand in Canada for 25 years. We actually stocked uh, PIC North America and Wisconsin, the original farms in Wisconsin from Canada originally, and also many other, uh, many other PIC businesses around the world, including Chile and Japan and and a number of other countries. Uh, then in about 1996, we, uh, PIC bought NPD and we're in direct competition with, 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 uh, uh, with PIC Canada. And so they bought the breeding stock rights back off uh, Sunterra, um, uh, or back off PIC Canada, and, uh, and then we went into commercial production. And so we got this big injection of cash, and, and so that was when we went on and, did, and started doing some other things. So a little bit about some of the other things that we do. Um, we're in pig production, cropping. We crop about 5,000 acres. Doug has a big beef, beef outfit. 
Um, uh, he runs about 5,000 cows. We run a 30,000 head beef feed lot. Um, uh, and between Doug and ourselves, we farm and ranch about 50,000 acres. So pretty good sized farming operation, quite apart from the pigs. And, uh, um, and Doug, and, and the, you'll see the Price families all the way through here. Doug's one of the, one of the brothers. Uh, we also have our own process, small processing plant. We started out uh, wanting to learn, when we're in the PIC business, wanting to learn more about meat. Um, so we had, uh, we had meat scientists on staff who, who uh, helped, us, helped us to uh, evaluate different lines. And then as that business grew, we, ex we exported most of the pork to Japan and, it, and discovered that we could actually send pork fresh to the Japanese market. So we built that up to about 2,500 pigs a week, skin off, going fresh into the Japanese market with a 55-day shelf life. Uh, for my sins, I ran the plant for two years after the plant manager got uh, uh, MS, so, so I know more about meat production than I ever really wanted to, so there you go. And then about uh, 12 months ago, a company called Retail Ready came to us and wanted to develop a, a brand of their own, and so we, put a, we added a skin online and another cutting floor, and so now we've just started producing a skin online for the North American market and hoping to get some of that product into China as well, which, which we've just started doing. So we get about 4,000 a week now. We're known by the public for our, for our markets. We have 10 retail outlets. We, uh, we serve over 5,000 lunches a day. They're a combination of uh, grocery stores and downtown bistros, and some of them are a bit of a dual, have a bit of a dual purpose of both. But that's our face to the public, and so, so we're all about quality. And when you've got stores, people know you and they, know, and they see your product every day, and so you can't afford to let your guard down at all. So everything that's behind that has to have the same sort of mentality, that very high quality, high service mentality. So for example, if a customer goes into one of our stores and has a question about, about the pig production, the guys who work in the store in the meat counters know the whole story behind that meat because it's our own meat in the stores. And if it's a question they can't answer, Quite often, I'll get calls from customers of the stores wanting to know about pig production practices. And so we have to be able to live what we live, what, live and breathe what we, what we sell. Uh, There's some more pictures of our stores. You can see, again, it's all about quality, high quality, and, and all about that, that, that customer experience of being able to walk into a store and really get something that, that you're paying good value for. If you walk into one of our stores for lunch, it'll cost you about the same as getting a McDonald's meal, for example but we think that it's, it's better quality food and, and, and probably better for you than, than burger and fries, right? Even though it may, burger and fries may be pretty good. But. So that's a bit about the stores. Um, a bit about our pre-production. Uh, we've just acquired another, another unit, uh, another production firm. We have about 17,000 sales now. Uh, most of the pigs are finished in the US. Some of them are finished in Alberta that go through our own plant for one particular Japanese customer who wants the whole farm to plate story thing. The produ our production farms, our sow farms, are in uh, uh, Alberta and Ontario. Uh, PIC, most, all PIC sows and boars were in the process of turning this other herd over. We also have some specialty breeds. We have Berkshires and Lacombes, and anybody who'd like a Berkshire herd, you're more than welcome to them. They're about as difficult to manage as you can possibly be, but we have a customer in Japan who really, really likes Berkshire pork, and, and so he buys a lot of other products from us, so he continues to produce them. And, I get cussed out every day, every time I go into the farm by the guys who work there, but there you go. Uh, the progeny is finished in South Dakota, Iowa and South Dakota. We're very, we work on high health. That's, that's, our, that's our whole mantra is all about health. So all of our sow farms are frozen mycoplasma negative. We had one farm break with ED a couple of years ago. Other than that, we've been clean for, for as long as I've been there, which has been about 20 years. And that comes back from the the PIC genetic days where we were selling breeding stock and we had to maintain very high health. And that whole mentality comes through our, our production team and through our veterinarians like Doug and Greg who, who bring that mentality to our system. And the nutrition's overseen by Steve and Joel Derushi. Sorry, Joel, you got a small D there, but uh, you have to live with that. <laughs> uh, we're very pleased, we're really, really pleased to work with uh, Work with Small D and, and Steve Dreets, and, uh, and, and they've done a great job for us in, in understanding nutrition and understanding how to, how, not only how to produce pigs as, 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 as efficiently as we possibly can, but also with all of the changes that we've been through, you know, being, being flexible enough to change diets and to, and to go from, 
from diets with animal proteins in to diets without animal proteins to vegetarian diets for the, for the antibiotic free market and all kinds of things like that. We also do quite a bit of contract management. It's kind of a funny story. So we were finishing our own pigs down in the US. We've been doing that for about 18 years. And then about seven or eight years ago, one of our, one of our neighbors in, 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 Iowa, in uh, Alberta lost their contract with Olimil and asked us if we would manage their pigs in the US. So we didn't really know anything about pig management. So we said, well, we'll work with you on it. And, and we can, we can, we can, as long as we can understand the cost together, we'll, we'll do it. So we started managing their 110,000 pigs, and then I was at Banff and talking to a good friend of mine uh, from uh, Orange City, and he buys a lot of pigs. He's a veterinarian, buys a lot of pigs, and, and finishes them in northwest Iowa, and he wasn't very happy with his management of his system. So he asked us to come in and do an evaluation. So we did an evaluation of his system, wrote up a report, gave it to him, and he said, well, will you manage 100,000 spaces for us? And that was about three years ago. We now manage 400,000 spaces for him as well. And then we work with two other big integrated companies who we also man who we start started managing pigs for. So that business has exploded. And a part of the reason for that is because of our, of our, of our mentality towards health and biosecurity and all of those sorts of things. And also the fact that we were one of the first people to get into South Dakota and start building barns and feed mills there. And so what we've done is we went into South Dakota about four or five years ago and built a feed mill and started putting finishing space around it. And, and, and that business has just exploded. And in the coming year, we're, we're expecting to grow about, to, to build about 200,000 spaces in South Dakota this year and about another 200,000 next year. And we're making some noise there, not intentionally, but the governor's been out to see us, the, the, the Secretary of Agriculture's come out to see us. And it's simply because there's a half a billion dollars being invested in South Dakota to raise these pigs in. And that's, you know, who else is investing half a billion dollars? We had an incident in, a, in a, one of the town hall meetings where somebody got up and tried to, tried to cause some problems for us and, and start wanting us to put our pigs two miles from any other pigs and put filters on our barns and all that sort of stuff. And the, and the, uh, the head of the county board turned around to this guy and he said, what do you think is going to happen here? You think somebody's going to come and build a car plant here? And they punted the guy out and about 80 farmers all stood there cheering as he was taken out of the courthouse. So the mentality in, in these places has changed dramatically. You know, we saw the stock market drop by 1,200 points yesterday. Corn's down to $3. And so how are you going to diversify your operation? The best way is by starting to build these contract bonds and to be able to invest in them. And then the kids can come back to the farm and they've got something to come back to that's generating income. So uh, let me see. Yeah, so by the end of the year, we'll probably be over 2, about, over, over two million pigs man, un, under management. And uh, that business is, 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 is continuing to grow and we're pretty, pretty pleased with it. So a little bit about the production information. All the units are 20 plus years old. Uh, because of our antibiotic free production, we're, having to, we're in the process of converting them all to loose house production. Um, all of our sows are antibiotic free, all loose, all of our, sorry, all of our antibiotic free sows are loose house. Two farms are converted to jest stall and one of them is converted to shoulder stalls because of the configuration of the barns. Um, we're ad lib feeding and farrowing, 28 to 30 pigs per sow per year. So we're not, we're not at that 35 pigs per sow per year or anything like that. We're all, about, we're, all, we're all about cost of production and quality production and, and, and doing things that differentiate ourselves away from the market. And, and we try to be the best that we possibly can be in that respect. Uh, pigs, are weaned, pigs are weaned at between 20 and 22 days of age. And we're in the process of moving to post-cervical insemination. So that's just a little bit about our production practices. We're learning all the time and trying to get better. So a little bit about our facilities. Uh, Mount Vista Farm in, in Alberta is out in the middle of nowhere, it's miles from anywhere, it's 4,400 South Fadarine, very good isolation, uh, recently converted to loose house production and their cameras and PIC, and we're converting over to PIC 280 bores. We were 327s, but, but because, again, because of the meat quality aspect of it and, uh, and the whole uh, antibiotic free production, we, we're, we're converting to Duroc bores. That's so, yeah, out in the middle of nowhere. It's a funny story about that. We were bringing some, my, uh, my, uh, raise my, raise the CEO of our company, and, and he was taking some Japanese customers out to see the unit because they like to see the pig farms, you know. So he was taking them out there, and they got about halfway out there, and they got so far from civilization, they made him turn around to go back because they were so scared that they were going to leave them out there and they were going to die out in the middle of nowhere in Alberta. So, you know, so if, 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 if this farm breaks with something, we screwed up. Or he screwed up. We blame it all on the vets, right? 
This is, what, this is what the loose house looks like that we've converted to there. They have one really good idea, which is this collapsible stall, which we put one of those in each one of the pens. And, uh, and so you've got a place to put any compromised sows in that, in that pen without having to remove her. And that just collapses right against, the wall, against this wall here um, when it's not being used. Um, it's worked pretty well. What we found is that uh, there's a lot of fighting the first time through because they're sows. If you start with gilts, it works. it's a whole lot easier. But if you start with sows, some of the older sows will fight quite a bit if, once, once, they, once they get mixed. The second time through, we're having much better success, lower fallout rate, and uh, a lot less fighting once they get used to the system. Uh, well, two farms in Ontario. This is Largy Farm. 20, each, they're, they're identical. Largy and Peterborough, 2,700 sows, loose sows, all PIC stock again. This one is located in Dutton, the other one's in Peterborough on the other side of Toronto. Uh, it's ident absolutely identical to Largy. Uh, 5,400 sows total, and all those pigs come down to the US as isoweens. This is what that looks like. And this is, so we put Gestal, Gestal stations in there and, con and converted this. This was easy to convert because it was fully slatted. We had to bust out some of the walkways in the middle, which was about six inches of concrete. So we had a couple of big guys with sledgehammers doing a lot of work there for a while. Uh, but, but this has been very successful. We're really, really pleased with this. And some of you will know this guy here, a um, good friend of ours, Gonzalo Castro from Chile. And he came out and, and uh, really, really liked the system and thinks that PIC should use it as a show unit. And we should be taking pigs from all over the people from all over the place to show them the units. But yeah, we're really pleased with that system. It was a million dollars to convert a 2,700 sow unit. So it was expensive to do. But by the same token, you get what you pay for. And we're really, really happy with the way that's turned out. We just bought uh, three new production units in Alberta this year. Uh, that's another 4,000 sows. Partners in Pork is what it was originally called, uh, County Line of Rimby, uh, Larry Agra Farms. Uh, the progeny is all going to be finished, oh, it's all finished in the USA now. Um, we're in the process of turning these farms over to antibiotic free production, so all of those will be loose housed by the time we get done. And this is in a partnership with a company called Retail Ready. They are a meat marketing company. So now we've got meat marketers mo moving into the ownership of sows. So things are changing in our industry very fast. They've decided they needed to understand what meat production was all about. And so, you know, here's a company that's been marketing beef and pork all of their lives, never been, had anything to do with production, and they're buying into sow units. All of these, so these pigs out of Ontario and, and Alberta come into South Dakota and Iowa, mostly into South Dakota now. Uh, it's about a 28-hour trek down there. Um, Pigs travel really well. We're in the middle of doing a study with the Prairie Swine Center, and we gave them the results. We, and out of uh, 140,000 pigs moved out of Ontario, we lost 70 uh, over a period of a year. So you can see the baby pigs travel really well. They lay down, and you know, I know Gary knows this because they ship pigs all over the place. They're, they, they're just amazing the way they, the way they, uh, the way they transport. So. Currently, we finish about 350,000 pigs a year in South Dakota and Iowa. Half are sold to one packer and half are custom processed for the retail ready chain. Of these, about 180,000 are raised without antibiotics now. And by the end of this year, we expect to be, to be up to about 270,000 pigs raised without antibiotics uh, in, in, Northwest, in, in South Dakota. Our nurseries are all 2,400 head. There's nothing real special about them. It's just our design, three square feet per pig. Uh, this is the layout, um, two rooms on either side, each with 1,200 pigs in, and then the central loadout and office. Small pens, dry feeders, cup drinkers, a loading docks of 40 inches, and then we have an office with a Danish entry, but, but we also have showers in them. So all of our, all of our, uh, all of our barns are shower, all of our nursery barns are shower in. Um, so what we did was, we, when we first moved to Iowa, we worked with Steve. Actually, Steve set this up for us. We set up a database, and we got about 3.5 million replications into our database. And once we had a whole bunch of replications in, Steve started pulling information out. And we looked at the opportunity cost on everything from pros breaks to feeders to, to type of bonds we were using to the type of ventilation systems in there to everything. And we started pulling information out. And what we discovered was that small pens work better than big pens in our system. And, 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 and I, I'm not saying that's the same for every system, but in our system, and I don't remember the numbers now, but there was the opportunity cost on small pens versus big pens was something like, I don't know if you remember it, a couple of bucks a pig or a buck and a half a pig or something in our system. 
And so we made our, all of our management decisions on the, on the style of the barns and the, and the type of barns that we built because of the information that we pulled out of that system. And the big, pe you know, you look at these big old feeders and you say, well, we used to use those back 20 years ago. Well, everybody was using tube feeders at the time and we said, well, tube feeders don't work because we have too many feed out events and it costs us too much money. So we went back to these big old feeders and they work great in our system. And again, it's because we've got contract growers and they're out, they're out in the fields and they've got other things to do other than production. So they, so they, wanna, they don't want to spend hours and hours in the barn checking feeders every, every 10 minutes. Finishing barns are double longs, uh, naturally ventilated. Uh, again, this is, this, this is what works in our system. Uh, the layout's pretty simple. Uh, two rooms, central, again, central loadout. Uh, small pens, 20 to 25 pigs per pen, seven and a half square feet per pig. We go up to eight square feet in the summertime so that we've got, we give them some extra space to, so they, we don't lose too much growth. Cup drinkers and a central office and loadout. Um, so on to the antibiotic free production. There's a number of different types of antibiotic free production which we, which we learned and I've just got three of them up here. There's limited use where you only use antibiotics without withdrawal, with, that have, you only use antibiotics that have no withdrawal period. There's 100 plus days antibiotic free which is mostly what's required in, the Jap in our Japanese markets. And then there's the never ever, never ever production which is what we do in Iowa. But the thing, to, thing that we really harp on is that all pigs sold in the United States and all pigs sold in North America are antibiotic free. When you, when you slaughter a pig, it's met as withdrawal time and what we have to do is educate the public to that. I'm not advocating, I'm not an advocate of antibiotic free production. We're getting a big premium for it and we made the decision when we went into it that if we could do it without it, without it compromising the welfare of the pigs, we would go ahead and do it. And it's taken us a while to understand and learn that, but we do it now and it works really, really well in our system. And Doug will show you some of the numbers a little bit more a little bit later on, but, but that was the decision we made. But that's the thing to remember, and that's the thing we have to communicate to people, because we don't do a good job of that. So a little bit about Canadian production practices. So we have a higher cost of production in Canada. Labor's more expensive, feed's more expensive, cost more to build buildings, all of those sorts of things. But it's easier because we have a lower density of pigs. We have smaller plants, our slaughter plants are a lot smaller than yours down here, so it's easier to segregate, segregate different lines of pigs. So for that reason, we're able to, we, we're able to and have to differentiate ourselves, differentiate ourselves in, in the marketplace. We use almost no ractopamine, uh, uh, because 60% of our, of our production is exported from Canada. So most of our production goes into Asia, and most of those countries want, want pork raised without ractopamine. We've, we, we don't, we've had, Mechadox has been banned in Canada for many, many years, so we have no Mechadox. And most of the production is moving to loose house production because the code of practice is requiring that or, or recommending it. <clears throat> and there's, there's also more raised without antibiotic production going on, especially in Quebec. So a lot of, a lot of our production is moving to those specialty markets. Uh, Pigs for our own plant are raised in Alberta, I talked about that. Furs and microbiome native herds. Uh, so this is the reason that we can, we, we can produce antibiotic pigs. This is how we do it. Furs and microbiome native herds. So the, the, the pigs that we produce for the Japanese markets are 120 days Jap antibiotic free. So that means in the nursery and finisher stages, we feed no antibiotics to those pigs. We raise 250 pigs in South Dakota, isolated nurseries and finishers. All of, our, all of our units are far enough away that they don't get, they don't get cross contamination. Pers are mycoplasma negative pigs and they we keep them clean to market. So we've had about 150, it's actually more like 250 groups in South Dakota and we've had two, two groups convert to, zero convert to pers out of 250 groups. Um, we keep the sows clean and stable. Guilt acclimatization is absolutely critical. Stability in the sow herds is, is critical. The GDU, we use the GDU to help bring stability and Gon that's where Gonzalo's helped us an awful lot to understand how to treat our gilts really, really well and to make sure that they're coming in and, 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 we're, and, we're, and they're productive and, 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 uh, and, and we can get the best possible lifetime out of them. And then Doug also brings in the whole idea of stability through gilt production. 
disease issues and cell hook cause disruptions in guilt flows quite apart from, the, fr from this stuff that happens. It also causes massive disruptions. When you get this, ha when this happens, and this is one of our herds, we broke the PED. So we're, we're, you know, it's just as much of a problem for us as it is other people. When you get that disruption, and you have to bring all those gilts in, then you've got a disruption not only in, in just your regular production, but you've also got a disruption in your herd, your herd, and then you have to go all the way back to square one and re-establish re the stability in those herds. So it's a huge issue. Switching breeding stock causes problems, right, Doug? So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the world's worst at that. I got into an awful lot of trouble over switching breeding stock sources in Alberta, and uh, we had one strain of Brachyspear, and the breeding stock company had a different strain, and we put them together, and we got, uh, we got clinical dysentery in our herds. So we went back to them and said, you've got dysentery? And they said, no, we don't. And we said, yes, you do. And they went and looked at it and found that they did. So, you know, sometimes we switch breeding stocks with the best, with the best of intentions, and it turns out to be a disaster. And the small bugs are the ones that cause problems, problems in ABF production. You know, we, have to keep, we have to keep those under control as best we can. And Doug will talk more about that as well. So no population treatments, the production practices in antibiotic-free production, no population treatments, individual treatments of pigs. So pigs are tagged, moved into a separate pen, and they go get sold into a different, different production line. Uh, no routine antibiotics in the farrowing uh, in RWA flows because the pigs can, can get into the feeder and get access to antibiotics if, if you feed it in, in sour rations. So you know, apparently that's a really bad thing if they get any of that. Uh, we use pea starch a lot for scouring litters. If we get any litter scouring, that's, that's, our, that's the big thing that we use to dry out the pigs. Um, the gray area is the use of coccidiostats at the moment. Um, we're still allowed to use them right now, so we use Baycox to c control coccidio coccidiosis. Vegetarian diets are only in loose house sows. Uh, biosecurity is absolutely critical, all the way from truckers. So this is so, so we use Danish entrances in all of our finishing barns in Iowa. We were one of the first people to do that. And you can imagine that Northwest Iowa farmers, when you start making them use Danish entrances, were, it was a little bit of a new thing for them. And then also on, on our trucking practices with, 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 our, with our truckers, you know, we're really, really strict on biosecurity with those guys. We've got one guy that's adhered to all of our biosecurity standards and has built his business around ours, his trucking business around ours simply because he kind of understands what we're talking about there and has done a great job of it. Unforeseen events are, are the biggest problem. You know, communication with our customers is really important. There has to be some flexibility. So to give you an example, last week we had, um, we had some feed that was delivered to one of our units that had, anti that, 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 that had not gone through the pro proper flushing pro practices. So it didn't have antibiotics in it, but the, but the feed that was made before it did, it was put into the bin, we sucked it out, we communicated with, with, with our customer about that. He went through it and said, okay, you did all the protocols that you possibly could have done, so that group of pigs is okay. But that communication is absolutely critical and making sure that we, 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 we keep that going all the time. There has to be some flexibility. You have to act quickly. Veterinary, veterinarians, of course, are key. Uh, we have maple, way more pigs com committed to the program than we actually produce antibiotic-free. We started out at about 60%. We're now up to about 80% of the pigs that we put through uh, RWA on those flows. And the rest of the pigs go into commercial flow. And the cost of RWA depends on the program. Who, it has to be understood who pays for that, who bears that cost. What is the value versus the cost? Because that value is going to erode over time as more production, as more pigs, RWA pigs get produced. And what is the longevity of RWA? So when we're looking at the program and deciding when, 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 whether to go into RWA production, and when we looked at that, we had to make a determination as to how long that was going to last. This is something some, one of our guys turned up, at a, turned up at one of his farms one day and there were raccoons in his bin. And so then you've got to make a decision. You know, is that, is that a bad enough issue that we've got to suck all the feed out of that bin, quite apart from the raccoons? Um, or, you know, what, what do we do to deal with those sort of unforeseen events? It talks about our database. Reco uh, recording's huge. Probably costs us a couple of bucks a pig just in recording costs and, and, and management practices. Um, yeah, all the pigs, treated pigs have to be tracked. Um, uh, traceability, or the Japanese are really all about traceability, so we have to be able to trace pigs right back to the farm of origin. Uh, for example, we had a needle, 
needle that was in, in one of our customers' pork, um, and he was, came back to us wanting to know if it was one of our, this was last week, wanting to know if it was from our herds. We were able to get the needle back, to, to identify the needle, determine that it wasn't one of the needles we used in our production practices, and also track the pork right back to the farms of origin that day so that we could then go back to the Japanese customer and say, okay, we've done our due diligence, here it is. It's not one of our needles, it must be from one of your other, one of your other suppliers. That's really important in, in, in all of our RWA practices. And, of course, we're audited. Uh, we're audited both by our end users and by the CFIA and the uh, USDA. And then in the plants, obviously, we have HACCP protocols in, in place to, to track that. Um, there's a lot of different auditing companies. There's a lot of new companies setting up audits. Make sure that you use one that is reputable. Uh, we, we're, we're audited by the USDA. Retailer audits are becoming very common, especially in Europe and more so here. Um, auditing is not an exact science. So we had an auditor to come into one of our sale units the other day, and we, we basically punted him because he just didn't know what he was talking about. So you get these guys that are coming in, even from reputable audit companies, who really don't know anything, anything about it, and they come in trying to tell you guys what to do, and you have to be able to differentiate between the bullshit and, the, and, the, and, the, and what's correct, right? So, so our guys are trained to do that, and they're really careful about communicating that back. Um, it's a lot of, why now? It's a lot of public fear in, from media stories. You know, we've got all these companies with making antibiotic-free claims. Um, there's a lack of new antibiotics and alternatives because of the anti antimicrobial resistance that everybody's worried about. Um, Antibiotic-free meat, we talked about that. Welfare-friendly production, lack of public, public understanding. We're really bad as an industry about getting our point across. You know, we're bad at talking to the public and we need to get better. I mean. You know, I look around here, you know, all of, all of us guys who are 50 plus, you know, I don't know what Twitter is. I don't, I don't even know, you know, apparently Mr. Trump does, but I don't know what Twitter, Twitter is. But, you know, the idea of communicating with some 20-year-old in the middle of the city, um, for me on Twitter, is, is almost impossible. So we have to do a better job of understanding how millennials think and how to get through to them and explaining, explaining our public our production practices and those sorts of things. You know, the public doesn't understand what ABF means. It doesn't understand what RWA means. There's just a lack of understanding there, right? And time's not on our side. The horse is bolted. People are convinced they need RWA meat. Um, it's too late. Is it too late to explain about our use of antibiotics? Can, uh, can we still get ahead of the curve and explain what antibiotic use is all about and that our free, all of our pork is antibiotic free? You know, I'm not advocating RWA production. I'm saying that there's an opportunity for us that we can take advantage of here, but all meat in, in North America is antibiotic-free anyway. It's too easy for, for, for meat salespeople, and believe me, I've dealt with them, to go out and say this meat's antibiotic-free rather than to go to their customers and to explain what, what production practices are and the fact that meat is antibiotic-free. They're too lazy. They don't want to have to deal with that, and they just want to get the meat out there and move it, right? Because there's a lot of it. Big premiums on RWA producers now. Now, does that mean that eventually it's going to become mainstream and those are going to erode? I suspect that they will erode some. But the main thing is, as an industry, we need to reduce our dependence on antibiotics because that's the trend. I don't believe that it's a fad. I believe that the trend is going to be movement towards less use of antibiotics in our industry as a whole. And so we have to be prepared for that and we have to take a look at our production practices and make sure that, that we're moving in that, sort of dire in that direction. So where's the science for us? We're rapidly learning about the roles of interactions between, you know, between bacteria. It's huge strides in understanding the, the gut microbiome in pigs' digestive tracts, and that's where you know, these guys at Kansas State are doing such a great job of understanding those sorts of things and, uh, and making us better producers. Uh, we need to understand, we need to have a better understanding of the interaction between nutrition and health. You know, antibiotics kill good good bugs as well as bad. So, you know, what does that mean for us in production as we understand more about the microbiome in, in the gut health? And, you know, the prime example we're talking about earlier on today is, is you know, we were always, we always had animal proteins in our, in our nursery diets. We used to use blood plasma. And then when the whole PED thing hit and we took the blood plasma out of the diet, so our performance improved. You know, and you start looking at it and you wonder why that is. Why, why is that? You know, why does that happen? And again, that goes back to, of needing a better understanding. And then, of course, we've got 
genetics that are helping us with, 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 resi with disease resistance. So what steps can we take? Public education, we need to continue to try to get the message out, responsible production. You know, all, all slaughters are free of antibiotics. We talked about that. Um, there's, you know, we should not, you know, we need to think about whether or not we're using human critical antibiotics in our production practices. Again, it's a controversial issue. Um, we try not to. We're moving in that direction as much as we can. Um, we don't use growth promotants. Um, only six pigs need to be treated with antibiotics rather than the blanket coverage that we've tended to use in the past. Uh, making sure we use antibiotics in a responsible manner, better policing our industry, monitor use, uh, better protection. You know, if, if we don't do it ourselves, it's going to be forced on us, and it's, it's as simple as that. You know, it's happened in Europe. We've seen it in Europe. We've seen antibiotic use being monitored by governments and being regulated by governments, and so we need to get out, out ahead of that curve and be doing a better job ourselves. And of course, protection of our industry in general. Most of you all have, have heard about the Pipestone Applied Research uh, uh, trial on transboundary diseases, and that's, that's pretty scary stuff. So this new stuff that we're looking at, to continue to improve through science. It's no longer a choice to say it's impossible to clean up our disease. Um, we're, acquiring tools to, we're always acquiring tools to improve health, and we need to use them. You know, these disease resistant pigs, filtered barns, alternatives on, you know, we need new ionophores and, and antibiotics to help us fight, fight disease. Uh, all the new vaccines that are coming on the market, you know, Hank Harris's vaccines, are, it's a new idea. Now there's a debate whether it works or not, but we need to continue pushing those boundaries and continue asking questions of ourselves all the time. Autogenous vaccines, and then again, uh, again, health through nutrition as well. So continue to work on getting a bearing on standard of the gut microbiomes, influencing development of healthy microbiomes in the baby pigs, train the development of piglets through, piglets through the immune response. All of those things are things that we're working with Steve and Doug on to try to be better producers. Look at research elsewhere. You know, there's, there's research on, human, on C. difficile in humans that is pretty interesting stuff. You know, we, need to, we need to constantly be looking beyond our own boundaries to see if there are solutions elsewhere. Uh, you know, an understanding environment influence on the fermentation process in the gut and reduce our dependence on antibiotics through science, as it talks about. ABF is not welfare friendly. That's the one thing we need to get across to people. It is not a welfare friendly, friendly production practice. Mortality goes up. When we first started, we jumped to about 6% mortality, and it took us quite a while to learn to manage those pigs and get it back down again. And the only way we could do that was the only way we can continue doing it is if we convinced ourselves that we could do it in a, in a responsible manner. We've proved ourselves that we can do it, but we're, it's pretty unique and it's not easy to do, and you have to be in the right areas to be able to do it. It's no good trying to do it in Northwest Iowa, for example. You know, the industry needs to be responsive and responsible. It's no good to say eliminating, eliminating disease is un, uneconomical anymore. Welfare versus profit, you know, which is going to win out? You know, if you try to argue that, that we can't afford to do that because it's, because it's too expensive and you're talking to people who are all over the welfare point of view, there's no question that the welfare point of view is going to win out. We cannot argue, argue psychological arguments with science. It just doesn't work. It's not going to win. We can do it all we want, but eventually people in the city are going to, are going to make their own decisions. It's not a fad, it's a trend. Um, so final, some final thoughts. This is one I read yesterday, which I kind of like. To commit murder is a crime. To write about it is literature. To have sex is perfectly legal. But in many countries, if you write about it, it's a crime. And you get put in jail for it. And it's a little bit like that about, with the stuff that we do. It's, it's crime to be abusive or to be cruel to animals. But some people want to make treating and looking after them properly impossible. So we've got the, we, we deal with these dilemmas all the time in our industry, and we have to learn to deal with them and learn to how, to how to manage them as best as we possibly can. You know, this week, the head of HSUS, Wayne Purcell, resigned due to sexual, sexual harassment claims. Does that mean people are going to question his morality? You know, here's a guy that's been, that's been telling us that we abuse animals all our lives, and all of a sudden he's caught being, being unethical, now, do we then, is the public then going to turn around and question whether or not what he's been saying is unethical as well? These are the sort of questions that we've got to wrestle with and we've got to 
be squeaky clean ourselves and be able to have a very clean face to the public and be able to defend what we do. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doug. Um, Doug's, go Doug's going to drill down a little bit better. He's going to talk about uh, why these guys, you know, why these guys don't get sick. Yes, sir. Obviously, you want all the money you can get for that, but when you go in to negotiate with your customers, how do you decide what the value of antibody-free in your production system is worth? What, what number do you put on when you walk in a room that this is the minimum we can take per pig to go to that program? So, I would say when we first got into it, our costs were probably in the range of $12 a pig to do antibody-free production. We've got that cost down considerably since then. I won't give you a number right now because that would be giving away trade secrets, right? But we've got, but, but, so there then has to be enough of a margin that we've got a buffer in there as well because the, the problem is, is not what are you getting now for your antibiotic-free production, pigs in, out of production. The, the question is, is, is what are you going to get three years from now? And how sustainable is that? Because we've invested, in order to turn these, these units over to antibiotic-free production, we've invested $2.5 million in these units turning into soil-free production. So we've got to make that money back as well as some. So we, we, we do that calculation and we say, we say, okay, over the next three years, we want to make this amount of money on our antibiotic-free production, and we want to be guaranteed to make that much money in order for us to put our time and effort and money into getting that done. And so that's how we make those decisions when we go into the, to those negotiations. Now, the other, the other flow that we've got, let me just finish the point, the other flow that we've got is that, is that now we're on the retail end of it, working with retail ready to actually meet, market that meat. And that means that we're now getting the antibiotic-free premium. We're getting part of the cutout, because as we know, the cutout and the, and the cash price have been, have been offside with each other for quite a while now. And we're also getting a share of the meat price. So that's much more attractive to us, because then we think that's long-term sustainable, because now we're participating all the way through the value chain. Can you at least tell us what your contracts are? Three year, 10 year? Uh, our, contracts, our contracts are, in fact, I'm just in the process of renegotiating our contracts, a three year contract with a one year evergreen. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, I'm going to turn. Yes, sir. So, yeah, sorry, um, uh, uh, the gentleman was asking about, about uh, how, does the genetic side, how does the genetic component play into what we do in into our decision making, yeah? Especially with also the PERS, anti, yeah. the PERS resistant uh, genes that are coming through. We're watching that. I mean, obviously, it's not commercially available yet. So, it's obviously, it's obviously of great interest to us, if, so long as it doesn't compromise other things that we're doing. Don't forget that we're also we're already PERS negative. So if we can have PERS, PERS resistant pigs in addition to that, that don't compromise the meat quality that we're producing, because we're all about quality. Right? We're not just selling antibiotic free production, we're selling we're about quality meat as well. And that's the reason we moved to the Duroc lines is to produce a, a really high quality if you sit down and have a very quality meat experience when a good quality experience when you're eating whatever cut of pork it is, you're going to go back and buy that pork. If you have a bad eating experience, it doesn't matter if it's antibiotic free, you're still not going to go back and buy that pork. So it's got to be a combination of, of, of what value does it bring to us as far as, as far as the disease resistant component goes, but also what are the other impacts of that breed in addition to, in addition to that one trait that it brings. So that's the way that we, we would evaluate those things. It can't, it can't take away from something else in order to just, just get that, that one trait. 